What's up beautiful people, it's Minsko here and today I'm exploring a new format for a video. Now if you do enjoy this type of video, make sure to let me know in the comments below or gently smash that like button. But what I want to achieve is to help you stay in the loop with what is actually happening in the UI and UX design world. New events, new products that are coming out, new features, whatever it might be, but they don't justify their own video. So let's jump right into it guys. Now a couple of days ago, Figma did announce that they have launched a new conference called schema it will be held on the October 8th this year it will be an online conference and it's all about design systems now in terms of time zones as you can see I am in GMT plus 11 which is Australian AEST time it does not really suit my time but with that said I do wake up around 5 30 to 6 a.m. every single day so if I can make it I will make the last two and a half hours but in terms of the speakers, they have a list of weapons talking about design systems. They've got people from Google, Netflix, Alassian, Lyft, Microsoft, and obviously Figma themselves. So if you can take part in this conference, I think you'll learn a bunch because if you take a look at their agenda, they're talking about some really interesting and hot topics in terms of design systems. Guidance over governance is a very hot topic right now in terms of it's a bit of a debate whether or not design systems are actually limiting their creativity inside design teams and organizations because they are built for consistency and reasonable components but at the same time does that limit the creativity of what designers can actually do within a product. Now that would be very interesting to hear from large organizations such as Netflix. Now other topics that are going to be talked about are code aligned UI kits which is obviously about preparing your UI kits and design systems for implementation and like some of the best practices and as you scroll further down there is a lot of interesting stuff including plugins and user centered design system and I think it's a great way to actually learn more perspectives about design systems from all sorts of disciplines and experience levels. Now if you are interested you have to head over to the apply to attend in the top right corner but you will be prepared. You have have to be prepared to answer a bunch of questions to reserve your spot. Now obviously I've done this myself, it does not guarantee that you do get a spot, you have to go through a vetting process and I guess Figma will get back to you once they've done that. Now the second thing that I want to share with you guys is Fig Jam's update in terms of being able to import and export CSV files from the application. Now if you're wondering what does that actually mean Ms. Code? What is a CSV file? Why would I import it? Why would I export it? Tell me more! So the thing is when you are working inside Fig Jam which is Figma's whiteboarding tool which is similar to Miro, generally it's for collaboration workshops and also whiteboarding sessions for where you are trying to brainstorm ideas, right? F synthesize user research. So here is an example. Right, so obviously you know, well most of you guys know I launched my very own Figma Masterclass and UI Design course. I've got around I think 20 or so students that have just graduated. So what I've done is, as a UX designer, I'm creating a survey to better understand how to have people progress through it, what are their thoughts, what are their feedback, what do they like, what do they not like. And generally that feedback is stored in a table inside of an application. Now if I want to extrapolate this data from this application, it's generally exported out in a CSV file. So once you've got that CSV file, you can head over to your Fig Jam, head over to the top left corner in this icon, go down to File, Import CSV, and you can just double click on the actual. Now once you've imported your CSV, what you can actually go ahead and do now is you can zoom right in and I'm going to show you an example over here. You can see the top row are all the questions that I was asking in the survey and all the rows beneath it are the responses, all in post-it notes. So if I want to synthesize this data, this feedback, I can go ahead and grab these three rows. I can now move it over over here, which I can't do inside the table. And now I can start to classify all the feedback from my students. I can start to group them where they are relevant. I can start to tag them. I can start to move things around and I can start to organize and really structure the way that I want to understand all this data. Because obviously, if you're working on a UX project or you're trying to synthesize the feedback for a course, you want to understand the commonalities, the themes, the common suggestions. So if you were to improve the product or improve the course, you want to find 
all the feedback and where the biggest pain point is. If everyone is talking about a specific part of the course that was terrible or was like needed improvement, then that is what I want to focus on. And it's much more effective to be able to do this inside something like Fig Jam where I can move the notes all the way around. Now, once you've done everything, you can actually go ahead and highlight specific parts of your Fig Jam board. You can right click and also go export selection and you, you can actually export it back out into a CSV or you can export it out as a PDF, which is also really, really effective and really useful for myself. So the third thing now I wanna show you guys is a new product that I just discovered today and it's called Doodle Ipsum. Now, if you are a designer, you obviously have heard of Lauren Ipsum. Lauren Ipsum is a placeholder content that can use for all your designs if you don't have content ready to be used in your design. So you just chuck in Lauren Ipsum and it just pre-fills it with gibberish. Now, Doodle Ipsum, on the other hand, is illustrations that you can use if illustrations are not ready just yet. So here, if you go to doodleipsum.com, and by the way, all the links are in the description below, you can go ahead and select a style of illustration that you want to doodle ipsum your designs with, right? So let's just go ahead and do abstract, you can do avatars, you can do random, you can do flat, they've got everything. Then you can select the proportions. So obviously if you are using designs inside your UI designs, you don't wanna have inconsistent dimensions. You wanna go with aspect ratios that are commonly used in UI design interfaces. So you don't have to have inconsistencies in your designs. So you can go one to one, 16 by nine, nine by 16, four by three, three by four. These are just the most common aspect ratios that you generally wanna be following with. Then you can also go ahead and select a transparent background. You can do a random background, or you can go ahead and let's just go 000, 000, 000 and you can set a, a black background so you can control it. Now, the, the really good thing about this is that you can go ahead and copy this URL. If you open this up inside your browser, you can actually copy and paste this image into your design, but you can also go ahead and embed this code. If you were building, for example, a portfolio website or a website for your client and you're still waiting for illustrations, you can embed this piece of code into your Webflow project or your website if you're building it from scratch and it will showcase these images. Now, if you want a little bit more control, a little bit more advanced features, if you scroll further down, you can actually go ahead and customize and actually implement more dynamic illustrations into your projects with code. So if, if you follow me, if you take a look over here, if you wanna change the background to an illustration, you don't have to generate it from just this website. You can go ahead and append parameters to this actual domain. So if you wanna change uh, the shape to a circle, you can see by appending shape equals circle, you are ab appending a parameter to help define what the, uh, the output should be. If you wanna make it grayscale, you can. If you wanna blur it, you can. So check out doodleipsum.com. It's a great little product and it's built by the team uh, at, at Blush, who is also known as Pablo Stanley. So not Pablo Escobar, it is Pablo Stanley. Great designer, very talented illustrator. Definitely check this out. So the fourth thing that I came across and I thought was really cool was grainy gradient backgrounds, right? This is a bit of a trend that is happening with a lot of web design uh, trends. So a lot of designs are starting to have a, this noise texture over their background or over an illustration. So if you wanted to, traditionally you would have to go into Photoshop, you have to head into feed, uh, filter, uh, you have to head into noise, and then you have to go add noise. And as you can see over here, this will add a noise and you'd obviously have to copy this. So you highlight, whoops, you can highlight this. Whoops, you have to highlight this. There we go. You have to command C this or save it as a JPEG and then you overlay it on top of your backgrounds and set it to potentially multiply. So it gives it that nice little texture on top of your images. But that actually requires you to add images to your a page, which will actually increase the page load. And also dealing with images, it means that if you ever decide to change anything or update anything, you'd have to redo the image and re-export it out. So a preference of mine is to always use code in replacement of anything that you wanna adjust or stylize in, in design. 
So I would always round my corners in code, add drop shadows in code, and now you can also add this SVG to create this noise. So you can see that if I adjust this, I can increase the size, I can also increase the frequency of the noise, and this, this number will also increase as well. Now, you can also append this through CSS. So this is very handy if you want to add noise to a specific design, but you don't want to use an image. So you can actually reference this to a developer and let them know that I want to add some noise to the background utilizing this piece of code, and they will be able to append this to the CSS and actually not require you to actually export any images out. One, you save on page load speed, and two, you don't need to deal with having to export images out. So that is a great solution. Now the next thing I wanna share with you is an article that I wrote last night. It's on thedesignship.com, and the link is in the description below. It is about overcoming imposter syndrome for UI and UX designers. Now, a lot of my mentees, I've been mentoring a lot of designers from all over the world for the last couple of years, and one of the biggest concerns, one of the biggest topics is about imposter syndrome for UI and UX designers. So in this article, I try to explain the thought process and my very own journey of overcoming imposter syndrome and how you can effectively do it as well. And this is literally step by step on how you can do it. And I really do hope that you can understand the thought process and the rationale behind this because facing imposter syndrome can be extremely tiring and can really cross you. So really do hope that you find value you in this article and yes the link is in the description now the last thing that I want to sh share with you guys is that LinkedIn I found out just today has launched dark mode for both mobile and also desktop now it is being rolled out right now so not everyone has access to this so if you do want access to it you do have to go into your account settings under preferences under display you can turn on dark mode now if you go through this article and it's actually really, it's quite insightful to understand that dark mode is not just a stylistic update to sort of keep up with trends. Dark mode is actually used for many different purposes. And more specifically, it is used to limit exposure to blue light. So obviously in sort of low light scenarios or situations or environments, you don't want to be exposed to blue too much blue light because it's going to affect your sleeping patterns and your ability to sleep. And there's a bit of science to it. As you can see here, said it in this paragraph over here, blue light display helps to improve your, de your device's readability in the daylight, but in low light situations, blue light can cause your brain to stop producing melatonin, which is this chemical in your brain that helps you relax and helps you sleep. So actually having dark mode is not just stylistic updates, it's actually for the user experience and also for the accessibility as well. So if you scroll further down, this is referencing what LinkedIn had to say about the dark mode updates. So they wanted to focus on first the accessibility because dark mode actually meets the accessibility standards with color and contrast of elements that help reduce eye strain and also sensitivity to light. And then they also wanted to be able to use this opportunity to introduce dark mode versions of their illustrations that are being utilized across the platform as well. And if you don't use LinkedIn and you think it's a boring platform, if you are a designer freelancing or running your very own design agency, I have to say you are missing out on an absolute gold mine if you're not on LinkedIn. Because every five to six figure project that I've sealed up in the past few years have all come through LinkedIn with connections that I've made within my network. So if you don't use LinkedIn, oh, you are missing out on a lot of cha-chings. All right, guys, hopefully you found this video extremely useful. Hopefully you learned a thing or two. Hopefully you are going to check out some of the links in the description below. And don't forget, if you did enjoy this type of video, this type of format, please let me know in the comments below or gently smash that like button, guys. And if you've watched to the end this far in the video, I would love to know what did you have for dinner today? I had some chicken, some kimchi, some rice, and some broccoli, and that went down so well, guys. All right, guys, I will see you in the next video very soon. What the?